So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Ashok Gadgil. Uh, professor Gadgil got his PhD from UC Berkeley in physics, and uh, he's a professor of civil environmental engineering, so a colleague of mine in the department. And uh, he's also the division director for environmental energy technologies at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is just up the hill from us here. Uh, he's done uh, a great deal of work on trying to help uh, with technologies that are appropriate for the developing world. Uh, and he's received many awards for his work in this area. Uh, the, the most prestigious award is that he's just been elected to the National Academy of Engineering, which is one of the highest professional honors that an engineer can receive. So thank you very much for coming to speak with us today, and we look forward to your remarks. Thanks so much, Rob. Uh, so this talk is about innovating technologies for the poorest two billion. And it gives me great pleasure to present it here uh, because in some sense, uh, doing engineering is about solving problems. And it gives uh, a sense of very deep satisfaction when you are able to solve problems that have uh, uh, an impact that you feel not just is intellectually satisfying, but also satisfying to some of your values about how you value other people's lives or saving them or making the world a better place. So in some sense, uh, this talk is about the kind of applied engineering that begins to address uh, issues that come close to satisfying uh, your intellectual ambition but also satisfying your search for doing something meaningful. Since uh, the title of the talk talks about innovating technologies, but in reality, if you look into the literature about innovation, the literature separates innovation and invention. Okay? The invention is like finding, say, discovering uh, how, a, how to make a transistor in the Bell Labs. That's, that's invention of the transistor. Uh, and innovation is when you take that invention and turn it into something that responds to market conditions. Uh, that means there is a user demand, there is a device that satisfies their need, and you can scale up and make hundreds of thousands or millions of these. So then this, this whole thing is like making a transistor, pocket transistor radio that Sony made uh, from the, the transistor that was invented at the Bell Labs, okay? So that's the difference. The, the, in reality, in this space, the space of the people who are at the bottom two billion economically, and I won't belabor the point of how hard their lives are, that's, that's well known if you just look on the web, you would know what I'm talking about. Uh, for those people, we need inventing and innovating and a sense of urgency all packaged into one to rapidly make an impact at a, at a scale that, that you are able to see and, and you are able to make sure actually happens. So I'm going to mix these up because that's what the talk is going to give you two examples, right? And I have only about 40 to 45 minutes, so I'm going to start essentially with a key summary to start with uh, and give you a high level summary of what my lessons learned are and then give you two examples as illustration, but, but that's, that's a way to make sure that we get to the main points first. So top level summary is if I wanted to build a low cost, high impact innovation, uh, it must be of course technically effective. It must do what it claims it does. And, and amazingly enough, you'd be surprised how many times you would find fuel efficient cook stoves in the field made by some good hearted NGO and distributed without paying attention to quality control or about how they are operated, that they actually don't save fuel. They're as bad as the stoves that they, they replace. In other words, technical effectiveness relies on your being skeptical about are you trying to, are you delivering what you promised? Because often the end user doesn't quite know if the water they are drinking that you say is disinfected or you say is arsenic free or the stove that is supposed to save fuel, they, do, they don't have the, the technical means to evaluate in the same way that you would. So technical effectiveness is, is kind of obvious, but 
but often people at the bottom of the economic pyramid who are often not even literate, they don't even have formal education, are at the mercy of your integrity and honesty and, and your skepticism of your own delivering the goods. It must be robust, it must actually work in an environment with intermittent or no electrical power, dust, grime, dirt, maybe the village has only one Phillips screwdriver, nobody has formal education, they can't read your instructions in English, so on. So it must operate in an environment very different from here, where you can just go down and to the Ace Hardware store and do whatever, you know, buy whatever you want, and things will work fine. It must be affordable, otherwise you can't scale it up and impact millions of lives. It must be culturally acceptable, that is obvious, but, but sometimes you'll be surprised. And it must fit a scalable business model. That's shorthand to say that if it is going to be financially viable, only then is going to actually go to scale and affect maybe 10 million or 100 million people and make their lives better. Because you don't want all the time to be begging for charity. Maybe you want to beg for charity when you're trying to do your initial test runs and field tests and get some grants. But when you want to go to scale, it must be self-supporting. It must have legs. And that means it must be financially viable, which means it must fit into a business model. And that business model doesn't have to be financially viable in the sense of extracting from these very poor people money to run the business. It may be possible for you to build a fuel efficient stove, for example, which saves enough carbon dioxide emissions that you are able to sell the carbon dioxide offsets in the European CO2 market, and the Europeans will pay to buy your CO2 offsets, and that will pay for the stove. So there's still a business model, okay? So the, the key point is it must, be, it must be able to scale up on its own and be financially viable. We are looking at that space of the problem, which are very complex, because poverty, as you would know, is not simply lack of having one stove or lack of having safe drinking water or X and Y. There is a whole lot of associated complexity that goes with people who are trapped in poverty, particularly people who are desperately trapped in poverty. So complex problems cannot generally be solved with the same approaches that we use in single disciplines solving single problems. This is a common space where you find textbook problems. This is a common space where you find problems in the real world that are really, really hard. Okay? So which means that you now need to go to figure out what does it take for you or anybody to go from here, which is where the textbooks are and your homeworks are, to go in the real world out there and do this. And this is even harder when you look at the bottom two billion people, because the institutions are not separated. There is no uh, regulatory body ensuring quality control. There is no consumer protection uh, federal institution ensuring that products are good and so on and so forth, okay? So what are my kind of take home lessons to solve hard real world problems in some sense, one of some of the hardest real world problems, I would say. And this is where I want, what I want to start, and then I'll give you a couple of examples, right? So first, and I think foremost almost, is to actually do sustained great work, you need to really work hard every day. The joke is you should be able to do all right if you, do, uh, if you work only half a day every day. That means 12 hours a day, okay? If you work 12 hours a day, every day, that's pretty good. You'll, you'll achieve a lot, that's only half a day. The other half day you can do whatever you want. But you can't do that unless you love your work. And you cannot love your work unless you do what is meaningful to you in the sense that is beyond just intellectual satisfaction. So that's where it closes a loop in the, in the sense of saying, what's it that going to appeal to you? How are you going to work? How are you going to work that hard to get to where you want to go, okay? Have fun, inventing is great fun, it's like solving puzzles, but a lot more meaningful when you succeed. Uh, and uh, so just enjoy it, it's playful, uh, it's, it's great. Learn everything about a subject with a passion, uh, that's relentless, uh, curiosity, a lot of curiosity, a lot of diligence. So you need, 
uh, as the saying goes, you need to shape your intellectual space, your expertise, like a capital T. So you have the, the horizontal bar on the T gives you the breadth, but it's pretty shallow. And then there may be one or two topics where you have a lot of depth, and that's enough. So at least you know what you don't know at a shallow level, so you know where to go to the experts. But there are a couple of places where you have that kind of depth that you actually bring to the table that others will be willing to work with you because it's mutually rewarding. Along with that, of course, goes point number four, because if, you're, if you need, you can't possibly know everything you need to know, your weaknesses, and that's fine. Uh, but you know your weaknesses, you team up with other brilliant energetic people with compensating strengths, and that works out to everybody's advantage. Okay? Uh, aim to fail quickly, uh, inexpensively and often, so experiment. Don't beat yourself up if you fail, because failing is part of learning. Okay? And don't get locked into a trajectory that's uh, kind of digging a dry hole deeper and deeper or be so terrified of failure that you're afraid to try at all, it is okay because you are going to new territory when you do any of this. And it's okay to fail so long as you prepare for yourself to recover and, and, and learn from your mistakes and go ahead. And lastly, I would say most, almost I would say most importantly, uh, be an optimist about yourself and about the world. Because when you try to tackle very hard problems, a lot of failures happen, and not because you want to fail quickly, you don't want to fail, but you still fail. And you, are, you have the resilience to stand up again and dust yourself off and go forward again and fail again, not willingly, against your will. But all of that happens only if you have the optimism that as a team, as yourself, you are doing it for the right reason, you're smart, you're not drilling down a dry hole all the time. So that optimism is important, and the optimism about the world is important. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on the world. You really can make an enormous difference. So I'll start with two illustrative examples, go through them quickly. Maybe we have time for questions, okay? And of course, I want to acknowledge uh, support from uh, UC Berkeley and a cluster of institutions around UC Berkeley, the Big Ideas, the Blum Center, and Sustainable Products and Solutions, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, US EPA, Department of Energy, USAID, uh, NCIIA, and, and lots of people whom I worked with, uh, very you know, dedicated, very smart, energetic, creative people, uh, lots of them students, a uh, lot of them just colleagues. So the first example is reducing rape, violence, and hunger uh, among uh, women and girls in Darfur. And this is about the Berkeley Darfur stove that you see sitting here. Uh, the conflict started in 2003. Uh, in one year, 400,000 people were murdered, and uh, they were mostly men, uh, mostly women and girls. Uh, 2.7 million of them uh, had their huts burned down and, and brothers and fathers and sons killed. Uh, and of, and of 80% of these people who survived are female, and they were driven into these crowded IDP camps. Uh, IDP is a, is a technical term standing for internally displaced people. These people are displaced inside their own countries, so they are not technically called refugees because they are still under the umbrella of their own government. So the United Nations has certain laws, and so you have to call them IDPs. And all these people, this, this is Darfur, about the size of France. Uh, and uh, all these people who were displaced actually had multi-room homes made out of bricks and, and, and thatched roofs. Uh, and, and you know they had their own herds of sheep, and um, they had their land, they were subsistence farmers. And this is how they ended up living in the camps when I visited them in 2005. Each of these huts with tarp and sticks uh, houses uh, survivors of a family, and they essentially are very close to destitution. The plight of the women in Darfur was that they were given dry food, but not fuel to cook it. So you cannot eat dry grain powder. That's all they were given, and some oil, but you can't just you know, dry grain powder and oil is not food. So they would have to leave the safety of the camps to gather fuel wood. 
And as you can imagine, you put concentrated people in, in IDP camps in the middle of a desert, arid area. This is just south of the, the, the Great Sahara Desert. There is not much biological productivity. So refugees leave or the IDPs leave, dig up whatever can be burnt, and they have this increasing zone of denudation that surrounds the camps. When I was there in 2005, the average trip already duration was more than seven hours. We, we, we asked random people systematically what's the duration of your trip. They would have to leave every other day on a trip like this. Here's a woman coming back with some fuel wood on her head. And um, if men left the camps and the Janjaweed, uh, which are the gangsters who are attacking them people, these people, if, they, if the Janjaweed caught the men, they would be murdered on the spot. If women uh, left the camp to collect field wood, they would be raped and mutilated and stripped. Uh, this was their way to humiliate them uh, in a way that was so bad that their, their own community would reject them once they were, uh, once they were raped. Uh, this is uh, women returning with a baby on the back, and this is still seven hours, okay? With wood on the head, uh, this is what life was like. I was excited to learn that uh, they cook on three stone fires, literally a stone one, stone two, stone three, supporting a round bottom pot in the space underneath you would light a fire. And the reason this was exciting to me was here was a weak link or a weak spot in the chain of causation that led to rape, hunger, hardship, and humiliation. And I'll come to the hunger part in a second. And that's because the three stone fires are only five to 7% efficient. The hunger part is relevant because very soon you would see uh, these people who barely survived an attack or whose friends were attacked didn't want to go out. So they started selling their food rations to middlemen who would sneak into the camps to buy UN food rations from these women for cash. And the food rations would be smuggled out and sold in towns. This happens, this is like Dickinsonian stuff, but this is what happens. And uh, you would then buy wood with the cash you earn from selling your food part of the time. So you go hungry part of the time, but then at least you are not exposed to the risk of uh, being attacked by the Janjaweed. So my goal was, of course, to go out and find the facts, find out what is the radius of curvature of the parts, what is the amount of fuel they were using, what kind of wood they are using. So I led that trip in November, December 2005. And uh, I took four stoves along with me. My, uh, my idea was there are a lot of people making stoves, take the stoves that will work, give them the stoves that do work. I'm done, I'm out of there. I didn't even want to go, honestly. It's civil war, conflict, violence, and, and risk. Uh, but the, the nonprofits with whom we were working basically said, we don't know how to test efficiency of stoves. You come and do this, and we'll be your hosts, but, but we, we don't have any way in which we, we are not taught in engineering science. We are in social work and the kind of things that nonprofits do for, for refugees, okay? So I ended up going, um, and none of the stoves was good enough, but at that time, each family used about a dollar worth of fuel, and this is the point I made earlier, which is the fuel wood was already being traded, because some women sold part of their rations to buy fuel wood, by now, 2012, 2013, 80% of people in North Darfur have found that wood is inaccessible within a day's walk. So now selling their food rations is the only way they are able to raise cash. So, so now this is the main way in which people are able to get meals by selling part of their food, okay? And the price has gone up in North Darfur. It used to be $1 a day. Now it is $2 a day. So we, we tested these stoves side by side. You see this, uh, uh, here is one stove, there is a three stone fire, there are other stoves in the background. The idea was we would be just sitting there, but with measured wood, measured food, using their fuel, their cooks, their pots, their cooking styles, and we wanted to see what stoves work. And then if any of them work, we are done with it. I was going to just come back and do my stuff. But as I pointed out earlier, none of the stoves was good enough. So then we ended up uh, working here with Berkeley students to actually begin to design a stove that would actually meet the requirements 
of mechanical stability, thermal efficiency in the presence of wind, uh, and so on. So here is, uh, uh, you would see, because, because they, they live in huts which are just made out of sticks, wind comes right through, six months is a lot of wind. So we have a, a little fan. There is an anemometer which you can barely see, measuring, making sure there is a five MPH wind coming at the pot from the side. Uh, thermocouples, and we are frying onions and making sure that we get the right temperature and then measuring how much wood does it take. And we built a stove that worked pretty decently, but didn't know how to build it in a manufacturable way because it was hand-built. So we started working, we worked during 2006 with Engineers Without Borders professional chapter in San Francisco who know a lot about how to design for manufacture uh, and quality control and production process. So now I'm jumping forward. This is version 14 of the stove. This is the stove you see here. And this is the assembly shop where the stoves are being built by Darfur men, survivors, uh, who are now trained to assemble stoves. And we'll see if this, this thing works. May work, may not, I don't know how this, nope, doesn't work, looks like. Let's try again. There. So, uh, you, this is a handheld video, so it, it, it shakes a little, but effectively what's going on is this is, this is their entire assembly shop. Uh, this is the piece where the, the flat kits, which are essentially steel sheets, punched, precision cut, are unpacked. They are folded into, let me move this over here. They are folded into the stove body, okay? Uh, further on, you would see people uh, using hand tools, uh, building uh, components like the feet for the stove and attaching the feet. Um, so you just see you no know, vice and hammer, very simple stuff. This guy is making the handles, which will be then attached to the stove. Uh, and then this guy is making the collar. You see this, this piece here, which is this top collar, because the, the stove has a flare. This is the only stove which accommodates parts of different sizes. Uh, a large size pot will sit on the top, a small size pot will sit inside. You're welcome to come close and look at it afterwards. Here's a woman who keeps a track of quality control and, and sends the stove back or rejects it in case it is not built correctly. And then lastly, this is the only mechanized part of the operation. There is a, there's a blue uh, compressed air line that drives a riveting gun so that this stove is pulled together with steel rivets, 64 of them. Um, and then uh, this woman keeps track of the serial number and keeps record of what is being built. And that's, that's a way to ensure that we have ability to trace where the stove goes. And Oxfam America is our partner on the ground. And now this has been upgraded. Now it actually says Darfur Stove Project or Potential Energy. That's the name of the nonprofit. Here are stoves made in 2010. Uh, stacks of them, the traditional method of making stoves uh, if you make a fuel efficient mud stove that was being promoted by a local NGO, it would take three days to build one stove. It'll last six months. This stove lasts for five years and you make it in five minutes with 12 people. So pretty fast. So here are stoves waiting now for distribution in the camps. Uh, each stove costs $20, which includes delivery to the camp and training of the women in use of the stove. And then in parallel, we were measuring for efficiency and emissions, making sure that we actually got a good stove, which is how you go to version 14 eventually. These are the test results from US EPA, and here is a publication that shows what the results are. And these are comparable stoves when we say in that same class or same category, means these are all stoves that use only natural convection, no fans, no electricity, and they only use natural wood, not engineered pellets or things like that, or not kerosene and fossil fuels. And you would see the Berkeley Darfur stove does pretty well in terms of low carbon monoxide emissions and low particulate emissions in terms of uh, per unit of energy delivered to the pot. Here is another uh, metric again taken from that publication as well as data for the retail cost collected by my postdoc. And good stoves as should be at the top there with high efficiency and low cost, we are somehow, we are one of the cheapest stoves with high efficiency. So that part works as well. Uh, um, 
And then we monitor for impact. You know, did we really do something that makes a difference? It works fine in the lab. How do you know it really works in the field? So 2010 survey, about 80 households, they reduced their household budget on fuel by half. It went from 33% to 15%, so little more than half. Uh, so each $20 stove saves about $350 per year for five years of its life, which means it's worth about $1,700 in the pocket of the women who would have otherwise be spending this money over five years to buy fuel wood, which means they, are, they, are, they, are, they can either spend it somewhere else or at least get better nourishment. This is what it looks like in the field. Here is, I don't know, with this light you can see it, but you can see the handle at least. And here is a woman with her, with her baby uh, cooking in, in her shelter. This is what the data looks like in terms of the impact survey. Uh, sample size is 82, average savings are 95 US cents per day with a standard deviation of 61 cents. Uh, this is what it, you know, the production is going on very well. They, they doubled the rate of assembly um, in, in the ways that we haven't had a chance to go and find out how they do this so much. We, our design of the assembly shop, which we designed in Berkeley, was 80 stoves uh, per day, but now they are actually more than double the production rate. So as of, yes. No, 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 no. The rocks were there to create a space under the pot. And the space under the space between the three stones is where you stick, put wood sticks and light them. It is, yeah, you can come up and take a look at it, yeah. So, uh, so far we have 27,000, more than 27,000 stoves distributed. Uh, uh, if you do the calculation, it's worth $47 million worth in the pockets of the women or their families. And we have 10,000 additional stoves planned in this year, uh, which will be additional $27 million in the hands of these additional recipients. And you'll get lots more detail if you go to that website. This is a nonprofit that is a spin-off spin from work done at Berkeley, on Berkeley campus and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Okay. Um, uh, second example is electrochemical arsenic remediation, um, which is dealing with the largest mass poisoning in the recorded history of mankind. And the background is that is arsenic in drinking water. Arsenic is one of the most toxic substances you would find in water. It is so toxic that the maximum allowed concentration by uh, WHO, World Health Organization, is only 10 parts per billion. Uh, that's the standard now. The U.S. has also adapted. Until very recently, it was 50 parts per billion. At 50 parts per billion, if somebody drinks that water for, say, lifetime exposure, their risk of dying from arsenic-related consequences is 1%, which is huge, which is completely unacceptable, which is why WHO pushed it down to 10 ppb. Uh, and the reason this became the largest mass poisoning in the recorded history uh, is because uh, with all support from UN and World Bank and everybody else, the Bangladeshis were encouraged to switch to tube wells like these with hand pumps because their sanitation investments were not there. Population shot up. They didn't have sanitation to control pathogens. So everybody said, well, go to tube wells. The, the soil will filter out the pathogens, and pathogen-free water will come out, which is correct, except nobody tested for what else comes out, and it was arsenic. Okay? Uh, so about 70 million people in Bangladesh alone, uh, you already heard about this, uh, measured Bangladesh groundwater has, found, has been found to have levels up to 2,000. We worked in areas which have several hundred parts per billion, like six, seven, hundred, eight hundred. Uh, consequences are horrific. Children get lower IQ. Uh, you have neuropathy, so you have constant pain. Uh, hand lesions open up, eventually becoming ulcerous, so you cannot do manual work. Uh, cancers, uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, on and on. It's a slow, painful, horrible death. So the grave problem remains unsolved for a whole range of reasons connected to how does technology need, 
how must technology work in the field? And uh, this would be a good way to look at it, but we will skip it because you can have the reference later and look it up. But primarily, these are socioeconomic reasons with which technology must work. In other words, your technological invention cannot be separate, isolated from the, the, the invention and innovation cannot be separated, right? You have to have a connection. So you are able to see how you are going to translate your invention into the innovation. So you've got to have that in the back of your mind as you go. And, and here is a quick list of why it fails. Uh, owing to lack of maintenance incentives and uh, unable to assure field performance and on and on. So here is uh, an example of 12 different arsenic removal technologies in the field in the Murshidabad district of West Bengal, India, right close to Bangladesh border where the same problem persists. And you would see some of them are used for storing grass. Some of them are used for uh, where you tie goats to them. And most of them are in disuse. So a PhD student in economics did a study of how quickly do they fail. More than 90% of them fail in the first six months. And oftentimes they fail because there is no societal mechanism to ensure use to make sure that they actually are maintained and used and there's no public education in the kind of risk these people face, okay? So what we need is actually a technology system that is effective, robust, and affordable, not just a technology invention. But I am focusing on, of course, the invention end of it, making sure that we can tie it up into a technology that is scalable. So ECAR is electrochemical arsenic remediation. You take some steel and turn it into an anode by putting negative electricity there. So you extract electrons. Uh, and that releases Fe2 into the water. Fe2 will turn into Fe3. That will grab the arsenic. It will also turn arsenic 3 into arsenic 5, which is then ionic. And it's, you're able to grab this lot of water chemistry that goes in there. In reality, you are, of course, competing against uh, phosphates and silicate, which are going for the same site. So there is an arsenic you want to catch in proportion to all the phosphates and silicates that are in the water. And you must remove that arsenic all the way down to 10 parts per billion. That's a technical challenge. But it seems to work well. Initial ideas where we tested them in, at Lawrence Berkeley lab and then here in Davis Hall on campus. And in every single case, we could start with 3,000 parts per billion of arsenic in the water, mixing arsenic three and five together. And every time we are able to bring it down to below 10 parts per billion reliably, assuredly. And that was in a single beaker. Now the challenge was, will it work in the field? Because in the field there are many other contaminants that are unlisted in the literature. So you go in the field, we went to Bangladesh and Cambodia. The red bars are the initial arsenic concentrations. Here is the vertical axis. The blue bars, which are hard to see, but you see the numbers here. Uh, they show you the arsenic concentration post-processing. Okay? So it certainly is technically effective. We are able to do this for sure. Even though Indian and Bangladeshi standards for safe drinking water are not down at 10, they are at 50. Because they say we are too poor, we can't afford to push the arsenic all the way down to 10. We want to give them water that is the same class of quality that the first world can do, and that's our goal. I think we can do that, okay? Uh, so ECAR advantages are is highly effective, uh, it's locally affordable, it's five paise, that is like 0.1 cent, you'll see this in a second. Uh, you don't need regeneration, you don't need create, use hazardous chemicals, it's simple supply chain, and it's the minimal sludge production passes uh, waste processing according to US EPF's protocol. So recent science results are all published in, in science journals, and, and you look at this if you get time. But uh, the, the operating cost plus amortized capital, I was mistaken, it's not one cent, it's 0.1 cent per liter, which means you can actually sell it for about 10 times more. One cent per liter is what you can sell it for, uh, and that's, that's cheaper than a cup of tea, and then that's, that's the idea, of course, okay? So it's affordable is financially viable, which makes it sustainable and scalable. So you heard this talk earlier 
uh, on UV waterworks, and that was a one example of a technology that is scalable because it is effective and affordable. And our idea is to use the same model for ECAR and take it to scale. So here's a 600 liter prototype being tested uh, last summer. Uh, Caroline Dillair is a PhD student in my group uh, here at Berkeley. And Siva is a visiting scholar from Berkeley who's gone uh, to work in Calcutta. So this is being tested in Calcutta now. So we went from one little beaker to uh, a big 600 liter prototype. Uh, you would see the, this is a dozing tank where you have steel plates inside. Is a six volt DC current, that's what you need, or maybe four volts depending on the water conductivity. And then once the sludge grams are arsenic, you settle it using alum and then you're done. And this is how good the results are when we took this whole device to a school where people were, where students were drinking arsenic laced groundwater because they had no other drink, groundwater to drink. They only had a hand pump and they used to drink water that was, now it's hard to read, but about 250 parts per billion. That was a routine thing. And when we, when we operated it day after day, we consistently got uh, certainly well less than 5 ppb. We got close to 2 ppb. And for more, you'll see this here in Gardgill Lab at berkeley.edu. And this is just a recap of what you already saw. And I think that's where I would like to end. And we have just five minutes for questions, OK? Yes, please. Yes, we are working. The question was, are there plans to take the stove to different countries? Uh, we are already working in Ethiopia. We modified the stove to work in Ethiopia to work with Ethiopian parts because it's really not the stove alone that's efficient. What you need to worry about, as you kind of I hinted at, is it's got to work with their fuel. It must work with their parts. It must be their cooking methods. If they are roasting, it works different than if you are making rice, which is just boiling. So we, we modified it, and it seems to work well with Ethiopian cooking, with the Ethiopia version of this. And Potential Energy just got a grant from USAID to go to Ethiopia with the modified version of the stove. And they are, we, are, we are testing it at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So we should be able to have stoves on the ground in Ethiopia. Very small dissemination uh, during this calendar year. Uh, maybe, maybe a couple of projects at one time. That's about it. It takes a lot. Uh, so I'm interested now in working on figuring out how to address fluoride in groundwater because that's a huge, huge, serious problem all along the Rift Valley in Africa and in many other parts of the world where people have to rely on groundwater. And exposure to fluoride in childhood leads to permanent very, very serious bone deformities. Uh, we'd like to figure out how to do it in a way that is affordable. But that is just dipping our toe in the water. And, and the Darfur Stoves project is, seems to be going well. Um, uh, but then there's a nonprofit that, that takes care of most of that work. It's, it's really good, the potential energy people. Uh, the UV Waterworks is out of my hands. I have nothing to do with it anymore. It's a commercial, for-profit company working in six countries, three in Africa, three in uh, Asia, serving five million people uh, every day by end of 2012 and growing, but I'm done. Yes. How, say it again? How do I get this project? Good question. The Darfur Stoves was not a project of my choice. I got a phone call from USAID who knew of my work in, about UV Waterworks. And they, they literally said, in Darfur camps, do you know about this? I said, yeah, I know about Darfur camps. They said, women are still being raped in droves. 
can you do something about providing them with better fuel than going out of the camps? And their proposal was I should start investigating uh, if I can design maybe a screw compressor to compact kitchen waste, dried kitchen waste, sun-dried kitchen waste into pelletized fuel. But I quickly showed there is not enough kitchen waste. They're burning five kilograms of fuel wood a day. So that was not an idea. And at that time, I was teaching at Stanford, so I would, visiting professor, I would just go back and forth. And all along going back and forth, I would just say, what is, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? So I kept on finding more information because it bugs you. And when you find that they cook on three stone fires, then it's like you have a solution in your back pocket and it's burning a hole in your pants. <laughs> so you have to make it work. <laughs> so sometimes projects come to you at a, by chance, but they come at you with a force that you can't resist. <laughs> sometimes you pick a project because it's doable and it's very satisfying and sweet to be able to make a big difference in the world with the science and engineering that us in the first world have at our fingertips. Uh, so sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>